Welcome to Opera Holland Park, where they're just putting the finishing touches to their splendid auditorium prior to their summer season. We're here on June the 3rd with Claire Grogan, John Higgs, Bob Stanley and Leslie Ann Jones. In these splendid surroundings, comfortable seating, a roof that keeps the rain off but lets the sunshine in, licensed bars and lavatories you would allow your mother to go to. Do join us. Well, welcome to another edition of Word in Your Ear. And we can't help but think that with Tim Burton's new Netflix series Wednesday and Susie of the Banshees headlining festivals once again, that there could not possibly be a better time to publish the definitive book of goth. Did it ever go away? Well, certainly not for its author, Cathy Unsworth, former teenage goth and now noir crime fiction writer. Cathy, fantastic to see you. And I think you're, you're, you're in your, your suitably, appropriately gothic basement. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. I'm in my little insalubrious basement, I should say. Yeah. Well, it's lovely <laughs> On to the see edge. you. Yes. Fantastic. Well, look, the book, Season of the Witch, The Book of Goth, it's broadly in two parts. It's, uh, it's partly the story of, uh, of goth itself, and it's partly your own personal story about being a goth. So can we start with that? Because that really, really interests me. Because as a teenage goth, you were kind of converted to the faith, weren't you? Yes, I was. And um, yeah, it's also, I guess, because I've framed the book between Margaret Thatcher getting elected and then her getting booted out and I wanted to show the music sort of as a reaction of those times and the powerful effect it had on me was there was kind of a good witch and a bad witch in my world. Yeah. And the bad witch was Margaret Thatcher. And the reason that I I got this definition of why I was really sure she was working for Satan from stealing one of my mum and dad's Dennis Wheatley books off the shelves, which... I wasn't even really sure why they had a book called The Satanist on their shelves. <laughs> but anyway, I stole it away and read it. And Dennis Wheatley gave this definition of a Satanist as somebody he wanted to um, basically disrupt the status quo and would do anything to foment class hatred, civil strife, strikes, etc., etc. And he made it also very, which I thought was the definition of Margaret Thatcher's policies, actually. And he made it very clear that, you know, he'd made a detailed study of, of the dark arts and he knew what he was talking about and how dangerous it was. So then I understood why my parents hated Margaret Thatcher so much, because obviously she was working for Satan and they needed these Dennis Wheatley books to tell them this. <laughs> I was quite convinced of that at the age of 11. And so Dennis Wheatley time. was one of your ways in. <laughs> <laughs> but describe describe what you looked like and also describe your bedroom at the time. Oh, well, the bedroom, bedroom was a very goth thing. It was, yeah, and it was quite a small bedroom and it had it overlooked by this huge weeping willow tree that had tentacles that tap, tap, tapped in an Edgar Allan Poe style on the window pane at night. And we lived in the middle of the field with no no very near neighbours at all and the wind howling and the sound of the foghorn coming from Yarmouth gave it quite an eerie atmosphere. And I was also obsessed with all the local horror stories. There was supposed to be a black hellhound that wandered around the area with red eyes. And he was called Old Shuck. If you looked into his eyes, you would die within three days. So it was the ideal environment to grow up being a girl. And so I what, had my... <laughs> sorry. So what I was your... My... Go on, carry on. Oh, sorry. I just I had my little radio, my radio by my bed, so I could listen to John Peel late at night while reading the Dennis Wheatley's. And he, the music he played was more scary than my surroundings. So for some reason, I took solace in that and thought if I was listening to Susie and the Punchies, nothing horrible could come and get me. So she was the good witch. She was the, all the good queen in my world. So Susie and the ba Susie and the Banshees were your first kind of musical love in this in this line. Yes, I think they probably were. Yeah. And right. because of her really arresting image as well. Yes, know. talk about the looks here because I I was I was pleased to read your book because it, it's more it's more fuel for my theory that pop music is entirely to do with hair. It's all hair. to do with hair. Hair. I agree. Hair is the important thing, you know. And Susie on the cover of this book, here, you know, with her magnificent hair, 
best yeah, coach. Talk, go on, talk about that. <laughs> well, it is really interesting you say that. And I can actually remember Bernard Ingham, he worked for Barbara Castle and Margaret Thatcher, saying that Margaret Thatcher was really jealous of Barbara Castle's hair because she had better style than her. So hair is important, just as important to those politicians. And yeah, Stevie definitely had the best hair of the 80s, but I never actually thought that I could achieve anything as good as her. But Robert Smith, on the other hand, I had this picture of him and it was a pit, all four banshees at the time and, and it was ripped out of smash hits. So UT probably helped me along with that. And it had a really good picture of Robert Smith in profile. So you could see exactly how to do his hair. So that was next to my mirror. <laughs> so did you model so your that, own hair? I was going to say that. So there must be yeah. a lot of practical work put in by people. I mean, generally, you, you were not alone in this. People up and no. down the country, Far from standing it. in and front I'm of like, bedroom mirrors, trying to make their hair do whatever was being done in the picture. Well, the greatest asset to any teenage goth was the discovery of crimpers, especially if you had curly hair like me, because crimpers would make your hair go into these little ribbons and it would make it twice as long as it was anywhere, which was the bigger, the better, obviously. And then you, that really helped you back home. And if you never washed your hair or only like about once a week, you could get so you could sleep on your Robert Smith tarantula head and you wake up next Tarantula time. hair, that's brilliant. <laughs> yes. didn't, didn't Mac McCulloch used to keep his hair aloft with a combination of orange juice and raw egg? Yeah, I remember him saying that in an interview that was in Smash Hits. <laughs> but I never... Yeah, he had really good hair. I think most of my male friends wanted to look like him, although... There were quite a few with the bleach blonde flat top that wanted to look like Kirk Brandon. Uh, his sort of almost semi rockabilly look was very popular as well. And Ian Asprey also, when he was in Death Cult and he had that sort of war paint on his face, half his face was blue and he had very crimp, obviously crimped hair. But I think actually more girls looked like Ian Asprey than boy. I think he was. How did you, like how did you communicate? Yeah. How did you communicate with other goths? Was that well, done you, through magazines or whatever? It's a lonely old world being a goth, isn't it? it was, Sitting in your bedroom writing mournful poetry, <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, what would happen is other goths were easy to spot. Especially yes. <laughs> it's a really important point. It is. It's a really important point. Because I always got the impression, sorry to cut across here, here, but it all contributes to the same point. I always yeah. used to get the impression that goths flourished in small towns in the UK. You, you would drive through these places and there would be a war memorial usually and, and the <laughs> local kids would be sitting. This is before multi-channel television and social media and so forth. Of course. They'd be sitting on the bottom of the war memorial and there would be two goths, maybe one Ted, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Ted, there'd be, yeah. Is, is there any truth? There'd be a Durani. <laughs> then... Absolutely. No, we used to sit around in the graveyard. I mean, it was <coughs> gothic, gothic architecture for you. Yeah. You'd sit in the graveyard. Fantastic. Yeah. There was one kid in our village that sat up a tree with a Dennis Wheatley book trying to summon Satan. Wow. Uh, he didn't manage to summon Satan, but he did get sent to the exorcist for his troubles. Oh, God. <laughs> it was still all a bit medieval in Norfolk. And, I mean, Norfolk does kind of have a strong witch-hunting tradition, yeah, no, so you have sure. to be does. quite careful. <laughs> I do remember a woman screaming at, and ushering her children behind her when she saw a group of us once. So, yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, so, but we were easy to spot, and in, in in little places like that, you cluster together for strength and yes, protection. <laughs> yeah. Were you yeah. used to getting mocked by rival by you know Germanies or, or whatever the rival the rival gangs were? Oh yeah, all the time, and and also <laughs> being called a slag by beer boys, which was hilarious. They get used, and I'd be wearing like a polo neck jumper up to here, a black skirt down to my ankles, and absolutely you know nothing. No. Whereas a beer girl would walk past with a mini micro mini skirt. All right, darling, you look lovely. So. You see, Mark and I are so old. I didn't even know the expression <laughs> "beer boys" and "beer girls." I'd never heard that either. And now I know. <laughs> I wasn't going to say anything. I was just nodding. <laughs> I know entirely what you mean now that you've said it. 
Well, I don't, maybe that was an indigenous Norfolk term. It could well species. have been. Yeah. It was the guys and girls who went down the pub, wasn't it? Basically, yeah, and wore feeler and sort of golfing jumpers and yeah. That's right, sports gear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, the goths, goths' greatest enemy, I should imagine. Actually, absolutely. But we got a bit violent after three pints. They would get violent, yeah, and we had to avoid them. And we were lucky. Our protectors were actually the Hells Angels, fittingly enough. We had a the outcasts, our local chapter were called, and we were allowed to drink in their pub along with the older punk rockers who sort of took us little more sensitive types under their wing, really. And so you, you no longer live in Norfolk, presumably. No, um, I don't, no. Do, do you ever go back there? And I just wonder whether the people, whether you still see that kind of thing in, in oh, rural definitely. Norfolk. Yeah, I don't think that that's another good thing about Norfolk. I don't think that sort of subcultures ever die there because it's kind of a big empty county and people need those things. I think there will never not be bikers in Norfolk. There will never not be goths. I actually think metal and goth are kind of two subcultures that probably will go on forever because, you know. Why is that? Because it's just so isolated? Is, is that what it is? Because it's. It's yeah, real? and because it takes a while to figure out that it's okay not to be like everyone else, doesn't it? And you kind of need a sort of framework of friends who also don't fit in somehow to show you that it's it's okay, it's not any fault with you that you don't fit in. It's actually quite good. So, so was it possible to be a goth at school? Well, semi, it was. I mean, although I had to hide half my gear in my desk because my parents would not have liked it if they knew what was really going on. But, but yeah, you couldn't you have could turned up with the tarantula hair, could you? No, the hair had to be subdued for school, but you could like hide. I had a pair of winkle picker shoes that I was really proud of that I got from Mr. Shoes in Norwich, and I hid them in my desk. And, you know, you could put fishnet tights on in the box instead of your normal regulation does. And the skirt as long as possible, basically. And for some reason, cardigans as long as possible. And then write the names of all the bands over you. Get one of those um, bags from Army and Navy. Oh, yeah, the canvas thing. bags. Yeah, and just practice doing all the band logos and things over. So what band carry. names did you write on it? Susie and the Banshees in that nice, she had really nice sort of art new. Art Nouveau lettering and, and some of her. And Killing Joke was really popular. And, you know, there was a whole load of, in in my, in that pub, people used to spend hours decorating the backs of their leather jackets with the exact yes. facsimile of the record cover. And I remember somebody had that amazing Killing Joke first album, which is a Don McCullen photo of writers in Derry. And they just had the exact picture replicated on the back of their leather jacket. So it's highly artistic. <laughs> right, right. So when did you, well, what was the first kind of gig that you went to where you thought, I'm amongst my own people here? Was oh, there any yeah. great coming out? Yeah, it was a real gothtopia gig. It was the York Rock Festival of 1984, which was headlined by Echo and the Bunnymen, then Spear of Destiny, then the Sisters of Mercy, then the Chameleons, who were slightly on a more proggy end of goth, but still really good. And then the not at all goth, but very good friends with the Sisters of Mercy, the Redskins, who were... Oh, yeah. You know, who were brilliant as well. Who were sort of really into Tamla Motown, but also real Marxists. <laughs> Redskins, that was their thing. So that was, a, that was, I saved up all... I had a summer job in the guest house and I saved all my money and me and four of my friends all went together. And uh, I was a bit team leader because I remember I saw the advert and I was like, we have to go to this and I booked the ticket and I found a hotel. Got wow. It's calling. Yeah, <laughs> it was. <laughs> and then I found out loads of other people that I met later were also at this gig, like David Peace, the novelist, was there and that was of course, again, yeah. David Peace comes from where I come from in Yorkshire. So Yorkshire plays a big part in this book, doesn't it? Get it? Yeah, I Talk call it that. Gosson County, I call it. And oh, really? Yeah, it is interesting because the two big hubs of Leeds and Bradford where a lot of the really important bands came from. And but I also thought it was really interesting doing the psychogeography of, because I like just putting the psycho into geography. 
And the fact that Leeds and Bradford have been against each other since William the Conqueror's time, then always on the opposing side in the War of the Roses and Civil Wars. And Bradford was more sort of parliamentarian, Leeds was more royalist. But then they actually are sort of joined forces when in the time of God, when it's like the Sisters of Mercy leading the way in, in Leeds and lots of other bands growing up from the F Club there and, and Soft Cell were there before they got huge stars. They lead massive creative hub. And then also Bradford, who had New Model Army, um, had this sort of house where they had a recording studio in the basement and other bands started forming there, Southern Death Cult formed there. And in that house was also the music journalist Stephen Wells and Jules, the poet. And they were the sort of more militant side to it. The sisters were more expressionistic but I still definitely got when Andrew Eldritch put Heartland that song I think was almost like he saw the minor strike coming in the crystal ball and on that same EP they did their cover of um, Gimme Shelter with War Children It's Just a Kiss Roy and then the minor strike happens and suddenly Leeds and Bradford are on the same side after all of this, so, it came so, together over goth. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. is it is it is it a characteristic of goth that people who like goth are really interested in history? Actually, I do, I think I, maybe it's just me, but yeah, history, English, and art were always my favourite subjects at school, and I think they still are. But I think goths are big readers, and they they like they history. like the idea of a story, don't they? Really. Yeah, I mean, Andrew Eldritch is a voracious reader and he loads of his lyrics come from books that he... Well, he was, he, didn't he do French and German at Oxford University? I think he did. Didn't he? I mean, yeah, he was at... Major was intellectual, at, really, isn't he? Yeah, he was at Cambridge, actually. Um, at Cambridge. Yeah, and he they, he wanted to do Chinese and they wouldn't let him, so that's how he ended up in Leeds, because there was a call. But then he went to the F Club instead and met Claire Shearsby, the DJ who was the most beautiful woman in Leeds, and then suddenly... Yeah, they were the kind really... of John and Yoko of goth, weren't so they? The <laughs> thing, thing, yeah. that stru- thing that struck me with this book is, how the hell did you write this? How the hell did you... Just, I mean, the thing, the thing that strikes you is just how many people are in it. But there's also there's a core of people, aren't there, that make a lot of things happen, and... They meet, like me and my little goth mates meeting up in Yarmouth in the first place, they meet at these places like the F Club in Leeds and the Back Cave in London. And from all over the world, don't you think Nick came from the birthday party, came from Melbourne, and Neubaut and oh, and Sister and Neubaut and from Berlin, and then everyone decamps to Berlin after a while. And Lydia Lunch from New York and Jim Thurwell from New York, and that they all... They're in one place as well. And then there's another group of them in Yorkshire and spreading the virus around the country. Um, but you've obviously got the kind of brain that remembers all that stuff because a lot, a lot of that must be just you you being aware that so-and-so knew so-and-so and did so-and-so with so-and-so. Well, I guess I have met a, quite a lot of these people and, and I went to millions of gigs in, and so all these people fitted together and I, I guess... It's yeah, it's a lifetime of research has <laughs> really gone into this book. But um I guess the framework for me was doing a timeline of the eighties or, or from nineteen seventy nine to nineteen ninety when she goes and then You've got to, you've got to have a timeline that's the key yeah. to writing a book. You've got to have an exactly. arbitrary ba- date. That's all that matters. One at the beginning, one at the end, and then you work it out. <laughs> and then, there's yeah, also and- there's also another timeline, isn't there, that you go back to talking about what you call the goth fathers and the goth mothers, which I thought yeah. was really, really interesting. All the people who are part of the kind of DNA of goth, and, you you know, some of them are fairly obvious ones like Alistair Crowley and Vampira and Juliet Greco and the Brontes, Aubrey Beards and stuff. But there was some in there that was really interesting. Jim Morrison was one. You talk about these people as being the people who fed into the concept of goth. Why particularly Jim Morrison? Well, Jim's really... Like baroque in- poetry. Yeah, he's the most imp- – well, I put him first because I thought he's so important and in the timeline of Gothy it's as well. I yeah. wanted to show the sort of antecedents and how the musicians then got ideas from the music they loved from the past. And it's the three Ians of Goth um, <laughs> worshipped at the altar of Jim. And it's almost a bit spooky as well. Well, it is spooky. 
Um, the three Ians being Ian Asbury, Ian McCullough. Yeah, Ian I mean, Curtis summons him first. Ian Curtis. Ian, Ian Curtis really loved the way Jim Morrison sounded. And I think understood that Jim Morrison wanted to sound like Frank Sinatra because when Ian's singing on Closer, he's getting closer to that sound. And then there's the really, really spooky um, thing. His wife, Deborah, in her memoir said that on the morning when she went to his house and found him dead, while she was sort of waking up, she thought she could hear the door singing the end on the radio. So, yeah. And then, so after Ian Passer, Ian McCulloch, the next big Jim Morrison fan, I think, and the, the bunny men had that lovely Baroque sound, I think, that the mm. especially when they, they, when they created their masterpiece, Ocean Rain, I think they, that is just an album as good as any Doors album. They, they used to do like my Fire Live as part of their set. And I think I got into the Doors because of the bunny men going on about them and, you know, their music goes so brilliantly together, I think. But then there's a, you know, after they make Ocean Rain, the bunny men sort of splinter and it all gets acrimonious and and their drummer dies. And they when they replace Ian McCulloch, their drummer, Pete DeFreitas, dies on the way to the first rehearsal with the new singer. So that's all a bit spooky too. I don't know. I'm not saying the ghost of Jim has got anything to do with this, but just saying... You know, be careful of Jim worship taking it too far, unless you're Ian Asprey, who, yeah. who, who actually got to become Jim. Yes, he and did. He did. He, <laughs> did. He, <laughs> did. He, did. he was the singer of the Doors, wasn't he? That's yeah. an extraordinary idea, really. Yeah, and, it, and Ray, always... Man, Ray Mandrake did work with the Bunnymen as well. I almost forgot to That's say right, that. That's right, he did. Produced them. Yeah. That's right. So, but all yeah. this this list of people, I really I loved it. Jack Brell and. Um, Dr. John the Night Tripper, Johnny Cash, Nico. You know, what, yeah. what, I mean, is there a characteristic that they all have in common? Well, I think they all like wearing black and they all said they wanted to make, Lee Hazelwood's a big favourite one of mine and he always said he wanted to make music that wasn't normal. And he did sort of infuse his, was a genius, wasn't he? Because he could do all the production as well. Yeah. He, he started off with green. Grain, <laughs> Dwayne Eddy in a green silo to make that twang reverberate. And yeah, and his songs. And these boots are made for walking by Nancy Sinatra. You mentioned that as being a, a big goth m moment. Yeah, loads of goth bands covered these beats, including. She Nick wrote it. Yeah. yeah. And he, the one that, that she was on her last chance, Celine Nancy was, because she wasn't making it as a pop star. But Frank had heard. Lee's work with Dean Martin and said that, you know, work with him, he knows what he's doing. <laughs> and he said to her, don't sing it like Nancy Nice Person. Sing it like a 16-year-old who digs truckers. And that's all <laughs> <the> <laughs> <shit>. <laughs> So, yes, we love Lee. And I think I can Lydia Lunch and Roland Howard did a brilliant cover version of some Velvet Morning, which is probably the most mysterious song of all time. It, it's, it. it's extraordinary yeah. how influential those Lee Hazelwood records have become all those years later, isn't it, really? Yeah, he never sort of got the... But Lee's... I quite like the fact that he's mysterious and he disappeared to Sweden and no one really knows why. And you know, there was all these rumours that was it because Frank was going to get him for something. He had a contract out on him. And, <laughs> and then after Frank died, he comes back to America. And I actually got to see him and Nancy do a gig, which was amazing. There's yeah. never a sunny explanation in the world of golf. <laughs> there's a, there's no. always going to be, oh, Frank no. was after him, he disappeared. Yeah, it's all <laughs> to do with murder. <laughs> it's all Skullduggery. Like, yeah, yeah. Noir fiction and, yeah, so you can see why it sort of one thing leads to another, really. It's just, it's it's kind of, we, we all just love sitting around frightening each other, don't we, for yeah. kind of social reasons. You know? No, it's so true. And that is a thing that comes from childhood, isn't it? Ghost stories and horror stories and Edgar Allan and Poe, he's in there. And, right, yeah. right. So he was, was, he was really the kind of longest running goth act. You know, who's the who's the Beatles of goth? Well, a lot of the Beatles ran that long. <laughs> and the Rolling Stones of goth or whatever. But uh, Probably Andrew Eldritch would want to be the Rolling Stones of goth because he is still going and he's never He's still going, isn't he? Yeah. But he is more mysterious. I think that probably... Probably the Beatles of goth would be Nick Cave for going through the most 
you know, evolutions with his music. Although I actually do prefer the birthday party to the late stuff. He did, he has done some incredible music and worked with some amazing people in his time. And, you know. I thought it was very funny when he turned up at the coronation that the, the Daily Mail and all the media referred to him as the Dark Lord of Goth Music. <laughs> I was just yeah. thinking how the goth community would have felt about that. <laughs> Well, how he would have felt about it. <laughs> well, I, I find it really funny that they got so aggrieved. It's like, it's not as if Prince Charles has, you know, he's. I think he's kept worse company in the past. Than oh, absolutely. Oh, no, completely. No, no I think it's quite, quite right. But I love the idea that the goth community is so sort of sure about what the principles are that anybody's stepping outside be. them. They can't be. <laughs> I mean, it's such a, that's the thing that strikes me about it. It's a really broad church, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And it's that's why there could be, Many different books on Gotha, with everyone taking a different view onto who's the most important pe- papal in this. Genre. It's just it's the darker side of popular music, isn't it? Really, I mean, yeah, it, yeah, it is. Yeah, because you know, Black Sabbath are in there, really, aren't they? Yeah, they are. In there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I Industrial North. An evolution between Black Sabbath and Killing Jake, which then goes into Ministry and Industrial Music, and. Yeah. And whenever you see pictures of things like the, you know, the Whitby Goth Weekend or any of these steampunk festivals or whatever, you, you, know, you just get the impression it's still really thriving, isn't it's it? Probably bigger than ever, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I think it never... You can't, you can't kill what doesn't live, so goth probably will go on. But Whitby, <laughs> It also yeah, strikes me that Whitby. goths... Goths kind of... Part of them always remains goths. It was a very, very intense relationship. You know, you can be a Gerani or whatever, you know, and you, but that's just a, a phase in your birth. But goths, there's something about them that retains some of those elements. Although, is that true, do you think? Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I put a sort of... a sex section of my book about building your own gothic library and, and midnight movies of the important yeah. films. Not just the ones that they were watching, but... Also, I wanted to put in there films that could show you a bit about, about what the places were like. When, yeah. You know, pressure by Horace Ave shows you what Notting Hill looks like when Killian Joke first formed in a squat in Holland Park, which seems that how could that possibly happen today when it's a bankster's paradise there? And uh, I also had Charlie Bubbles, um, which shows you what Manchester, you know. Oh, how, Charlie Bubbles. How bleak and the whisperers, yes. which shows you how bleak the North really looked, you know, mm. even in the early 60s. And, and then things like I Start Counting, which shows you the post-war rebuild. There's quite a few really interesting films like that and the offence with Sean Connery that, show that, that these weird new worlds coming up after the war and these are the worlds that Joy Division and the Banshees grew up in and that, that sort of atmosphere, I think, carries into their music and it is about place and it is about a tradition. A tradition and, and maybe it is the fact that they, the original, the Doors name comes from William Blake, doesn't it? And yeah. William yeah. Blake, he saw the dark... Doors of Deception, yeah. Yeah, and repurposed by Aldous Huxley, but he saw he he saw those dark satanic mills rising, and then our goth bands at, at the end of this process are witnessing the end of heavy industry, and it's another massive cultural shock, like the Industrial Revolution was, that they're responding to just on the other end of it. Who invented the term goth? That is also debatable, <laughs> and another thing I try and carry on looking at through the book and also laughing at the fact that no one ever was a goth and it was a, a, a term that was considered to be an insult. Um, I found a very early review of Joy Division by Mary Harron in Melody Maker that, oh, right. that drew these links between the romantic gothic and said that, you know, instead of castles, they're factories and she got that totally right. And then Abbe from UK to K, he... He was writing about werewolves and got those recordings that he made actually sounded, some of them to me sounded like he got hold of a, a tape of a werewolf. <laughs> you know, they had a really spooky sort of grainy hot house of horror film and he called it punk gothique. Um, Ian Asprey also claimed to have invented um, the term by calling, and he said he used to call Andy's sex gang a little goth little gothic name or something that was his affectionate name but that was after 
that was after UK to K. So, but I first remember it being used in that really disdainful your goth way. In about 1985, when I, can, I can't remember. Yeah, it was Yeah, it was. It was. It was basically saying you are a little Johnny Come Lately weekend weirdo, and you know you've just. <laughs> but it's that them. image of people just marooned in their bedrooms, hating their parents. You know. Yeah. And I was well, actually, like, what did your parents think? That's interesting. That. Well, how was your parents' reaction when you turned up with your tarantula hair? Well, I remember my dad just looking at me, and then. Looking, saying, I, 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 he first saw me like that, and he was coming to pick me up from the train. And he just looked, all the other dads are looking at me in such pity. What have you done? They were quite sarcastic about it, but my mum actually, she quite encouraged me. And in fact, she still wants me to have blue hair now. She was like, "No, that's the best colour you've ever had." They, my mum was quite arty, and she was into Aubrey Beardsley, and you know. She got Let me into your Oscar. makeup and stuff like that. Yeah, and she got me into Oscar Wilde when I was really young, so it's kind of all her fault anyway. They made me what I am. <laughs> it's her fault. I blame the they parents. They made me live in the Don't come cry at me. <laughs> yeah. It's so funny. We should well, ask you the greatest we were there the greatest track of all time, but in your case the greatest goth track of all time. Yes, what is it? If what I wanted you, what is to get into goth, goth where would I start? Well, I think you would have to buy the classic Sisters of Mercy single, Alice, which um, would mean you also got on the flip side uh, floor show. And if you got the 12 inch, you'd get that cover um, of their cover of 1969 by the Stooges. That was the perfect, I think, that. But Alice and Floor Show are the two most brilliant tracks of Goth, I think, if I had to. And I can't actually tell you which one is the best, but they're both so evocative because. Alice is like this girl you meet at a party and she's lost her way and she's um, in a party dress and she's just waiting for somebody to give her some drugs. And you've all those, it reminds me of all those bottle parties sort of after, after the pubs closed parties and student digs in the eighties and some mad student house, there'd always be an Alice reeking of joss sticks in the corner. Yes. And what was your preferred brand of cider? I'm assuming there was cider. <laughs> There was a terrible cider in, in North in Yarmouth called James White's Norfolk Cider. And it wasn't even the colour of apples. It was just pure, it was like mess. It looked like that. And not it's sort of 40% the, proof. Or something. It was so horrible. It did. It tasted like drinking terps as well. And you like mix that in with, with something else. But if you wanted to get drunk quickly, that is, you would. Um, right. But even the biggest, no one could drink more than like three halves of it without passing out not even the king of the outcomes could. that's how lethal it was oh, we had that so at college wasn't... too Merry Down it was called Merry Down Cider wasn't it yeah you could, it served in half pints 30p that's why we had to put the black currant in it not just for goth reasons but for taste <laughs> oh god <laughs> oh that's terrific <laughs> very well, good well look thanks very much Cathy uh, oh that's, that's been a real laugh there's it's the book.